All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Pennington, and I'm with the Spirit of EQ. Joining me on this journey and uh, in our two-part session is Jeff East, who is with the Spirit of EQ. Uh, Hello. Jeff, welcome again. Yes. Um, so before we get started and dive into the meat of the session, we'll kind of give you some ground rules, some back, uh, background information to help you a little bit. Um, you may know a little bit about our company and what this is all about as it relates to emotional intelligence. But um, Jeff and I uh, have worked together for a bit uh, and we, we host a podcast together for our company. Um, and that's important because the way that Jeff and I operate when we do these sessions uh, is that we work in partnership and we, and we really like it to be interactive. Now, having said that, interactive does not mean that this is not a safe place, okay? Uh, both Jeff and I believe in psychologically safe places where uh, you can feel free to participate and you can feel free to just be quiet. You can use video. You don't have to use video. The only thing I would ask is that please have the ability to hear and to observe visually. Uh, but that's kind of how we approach things a bit. Um, as I may have said earlier on, these two sessions are designed for you to be able to gather this information and make application with it, whether it's today or in the future, uh, whether it's relating to your personal life, to your school life, to work, future work, whatever that may be. Um, Jeff mentioned a little earlier, and it's really kind of important, we'll work mostly in communication with the chat, uh, which is down at the very bottom of your screen, for you to be able to type. Um, there'll be times when I'll ask you for your insights, your, your observations, but if there's any point during the session where you're going, oh, whoa, whoa, stop, 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 go ahead and type something in there, whether Jeff or I, one of us will, will observe and just kind of make sure that that's being monitored. Um, and then just from a little bit of housekeeping perspective, at the very left-hand bottom of your screen, that's where you have your controls with Zoom. Some of you may be used to that, where you can mute yourself, you can go in video, out of video, whatever works best for you. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. So if all of my wonderful tools are working as I, yes, look at that. First time out, Jeff, and it worked. All right, I'm you impressed. Like it, huh? I'm impressed. All right. <laughs> So, boom, boom. so we're using slides tonight, um, but fear not. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we do not believe in death by PowerPoint. This is kind of just a little bit of a compass, if you will, uh, designed to kind of give us a sort of a roadmap about where we're going and um, how we're going to get there and kind of give you some direction. So uh, tonight's session is uh, part one of two. This is the one on unlocking EQ. Uh, EQ uh, is just, it's an acronym, is short for emotional intelligence. Don't feel bad if you're not fully familiar with the term and all of its meaning and all of that. That's cool because uh, we're gonna kind of bring that to the fore with you, kind of give you some good explanations and hopefully give you some, uh, uh, some ideas around how it can be used and applied. Um, I don't repeat who I am or Jeff is, uh, but the first slide here uh, is, um, is one of my favorites. Um, it has to do with the wonderful iceberg. And when you look at that, uh, many people, when they see an iceberg, you know, it's this large thing and we think of Antarctica and it's just big. But as you can look at that uh, image, you can definitely tell the larger part of the iceberg is beneath the surface. And it's a representation of that. And beneath the surface is where we find our emotional intelligence. It's, it's where so much of what we do is driven. The upper part of the iceberg, which I believe it's actually scientifically that most of the iceberg at the, above the surface is about an 11th of the total size of the iceberg, typically. So where we're gonna go tonight is to try to understand a bit more about what's happening beneath the surface and how that is applied. So when you look at that, um, we wanna understand ourselves, right? We wanna understand what 
is driving our behaviors. Um, we'll see a little bit later about the idea about emotional intelligence being the blending of thought and emotion to make optimal decisions. And I really like that uh, particular definition uh, because it really does explain what's really at the core of why we do what we do. So this kind of implies that we got to go to places that may be uh, a little touchy, a little thorny, maybe a little sensitive. We're going to dig deep and go down in order to try to understand a bit more about what's happening there. Uh, again, Jeff and I uh, and our company, Spirit of EQ, we definitely believe in the idea, the, the theme of psychologically safe environments. You do not have to feel compelled to participate. You don't have to feel that, hey, Eric's gonna pick on me and ask me questions and I don't feel comfortable. Don't worry about that because we don't do that. This is designed for you to learn at your pace and where you're most comfortable and where you can be most effective. So we really wanna drive that point home. However, for us to understand emotional intelligence, we do need to go beneath the surface and kind of look at some things to help us understand. And again, to help us move to that place where we're applying our learning and turning that into doing. All right, so when you look at this map, what's the first thing that leaps out for you um, in terms of change? So this is an opportunity, if you would, to maybe type some things in your chat. And, and I'll kind of inform this a little bit uh, the map is very uh, visually, it's all over the place there with all the lines. But do you find in the world in which you live, maybe your studies, your, your career aspirations, that things are changing rapidly? So if you would in your chat, mention some things that you're seeing that have been changing rapidly in, in your world or what you've observed. And then Jeff, I'll let you kind of observe and maybe we'll share it uh, as a group. Okay. And one of the things as you're thinking and maybe writing there, um, think about the things that maybe are challenging you with the change. Uh, what are some of those feelings that emotions that are kind of going through you when you think about the changes? Uh, we have work responsibilities and data and data analytics, daily part, political landscape, technology and leadership, Technology ready to connected world. <laughs> this is one that I totally agree with the power that social media has. Mm. Uh, the new world is so out of date, whereas the old world is pretty accurate. Technology has grown from nothing to relying on it for everything. Those are great. Yeah. So as we think about that for a moment, and all those are really wonderful insights. Um, think about what are some of the benefits of the change? Think about its impact on leadership. And leadership is not just a title and a corner office and being able to tell people what to do. You know, at Spirit of EQ, we kind of define leadership as its influence. So wherever you are, more than likely, you got some influence. So we're all leaders. So how does it impact that? So as we move forward here, we're getting ready to look at a, uh, a brief video uh, of one of my favorite and Jeff's favorite, actually, musicians of all time. Um, hopefully it will not date me. Some of you may have heard of him, some of you may not have, but it's an interview. Um, and in this interview, this particular individual unlocks some things that I'd like you to observe um, as it relates to not only managing change that's coming at you, but think about it also from the perspective about the times in your life, and you may be in that midst right now, where you're the one that's kind of pushing the change. Maybe it's a career thing, maybe it's a work, maybe it's a family thing. And think about that from that perspective, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of unwrap that a little bit as a group here in a second. So the musician's name is Neil Peart, and Neil Peart is a drummer, 
Um, fantastic drummer, in my opinion. Uh, Jeff would second that. Um, <laughs> and um, this interview is from a few years back, but uh, it's a great conversation around what we've talked about. So let's take a listen. Now, what about your relationship with drumming and how it's changed over the years? Because you've, been, you've done it so long and drumming for Rush is not, it's not like you just do, <laughs> no. I mean, there's some stuff going on there, right? Yeah. So has your relationship with, with, with your, as a, the instrument changed over the years? Uh, enormously so in all those inner ways that might be boring to anyone else, but I feel them strongly. Um, and it occurred to me lately that the band, even after all these years, 36 years, we're going through changes right now as individual musicians and us, you know, as, as a unit of musicians. And I found that um, part of it's been deliberate that I've studied with teachers from time to time. And two years ago, I studied with the great jazz drummer, Peter Erskine, and it was mainly to learn more about big band drumming that I admire. But in the process, of course, I couldn't help learning more about drumming and carried it with me into what I do. No. And um, the teachers that I've had in the past, I had a great old time teacher in the mid 90s that kind of helped me reinvent the way I approach the instrument that still nourishes me now and the inspiration of other players too when you hear somebody who play something great old or new you know it inspires you and I found since I was a little kid not that I wanted to imitate it but it just made me want to play you know and and not and I've heard some musicians say there was a famous one of Eric Clapton saying he wanted to burn his guitar after hearing Jimi Hendrix and um, um, you know, the, the horn player uh, wanting to smash his horn after hearing Miles Davis, that kind of thing. And I never understood that. If I hear somebody great, it makes me want to go home and play. Like, not out of frustration, but out of joy. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of people who heard a Neil Peart drum and went, I, I want to smash my drums. Well, I hear that. So people say, oh, you inspired me to take up drumming. And I said, I'm sorry to your parents. <laughs> what else can I say? So when you go on, on one of these journeys and, you, and you've met new teachers and you come back, do Getty and Alex start to panic? Like, Neil's back with a new sound. We, got to, we have to, oh, God, here we go. Well, of course, they're subtle and incremental, but the, the one big change I made in 95 where I changed the whole setup of my drums and literally the way I held the sticks and just dedicated myself to doing everything different. And when I first came back with the band and we were working with producer Peter Collins at the time, and he was listening to my playing on the demos and so on and saying, well, it doesn't sound that much different to me. And to me, that was a compliment because I changed everything and it still sounded like me. And then when I started playing with the other guys, they did notice the clock. It was a subtle difference, but they had to mesh with me. And I mean, these things are indefinably subtle but they were things that i've wanted to work on for 20 years and i guess a good advantage a, a good example of it is technique i worked so much with uh, um, sequencers and click tracks that i became remarkably metronomic you know but that had a rigidity that went with it so my mission then became to conquer that and become looser so if you think of a technique instrument and a feel um player those are the two uh, differences that I tried to bridge and I'm still trying to bridge. I want to become more improvisational because I'm compositional. And my last uh, drum instructional video was on drum soloing. And I said, I compose a solo and then perform the variations within it as a piece of music for the audience. And right at that moment I said, oh, okay, I'm a composer, but I want to be an improviser. So I started working really hard on that. And now at this point, the first half of my solo is completely improvised from the first beat through, you know, changes that I become familiar with and come to like in the process of a night's discovery, or even in the night's warm up, I'll come across something, oh, that's good. And it goes in the solo that night. So for a guy that has, for adding the improvisation to your, your, your routine, when you get out on stage and you have to play and you know that the first part is completely improvised, do you get scared? Uh, it, it was nervous making it first, but then you learn to protect yourself <laughs> and that the second half is composed, again, for the audience's benefit. To so be just, like, just get there, just get to the second half? Well, it's never, no, I get lost in it, and I've made comparisons to exploring on the motorcycle, getting lost on roads that close. Yeah. And I wander down rhythmic areas that because I do challenge myself because there are no consequences. There's no mistake. If I do something weird, play it twice, and it's a new part, you know, a jazz <laughs> instrument, that's what I told you. <laughs> have you ever had, a, have you ever had the, the drumming solo equivalent of a motorcycle hitting a deer? <laughs> Have you ever been a good comparison because I've certainly had that experience. But um, again, in soloing, you can't. And that's why I'm more careful in the band's music because the, the proverbial train wreck where the whole band gets lost is a nightmare. And we've, over the years, of course, evolved ways out of that. It happens to everybody. You miss here a rhythm or an echo off the back wall of the venue sometimes can be a half beat out and if you lose concentration for a second you're suddenly half a beat out with the other guy and we just look at each other and you decide okay go with him <laughs> <laughs> When you consider uh, the things that Neil Peart mentioned there from a perspective of a musician, what are some things that go through your mind that you observed there that might relate to managing change 
making decisions and choices and those kind of things. Go ahead and type in your uh, chat box there and uh, Jeff, you'll monitor if you will, please. Yes, I will. Managing the fear of change, uh, getting out of your comfort zone, change is innovation. I'm gonna stop there for a minute. Uh, the change is innovation. Um, if you wrote that, um, again, I want you to be comfortable. So right further in the chat, unwrap that a little bit for us. When you say change is innovation, or if you'd like to take yourself off of mute, and you want to just go verbal, you can do that as well. Hello, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hi, so my name is Peng. Um, why I say change is innovation is because I look at change as technology. You know, technology is continuously advancing and if we don't keep up with the trend, we obsolete. So we, uh, we, we, keep up we have to keep up with it that's that's my analogy of change if wow that's great that's great thing and you know what um i probably uh should write a check and send it to you because uh that is what leaped out for me with what he was talking about because one of the things that he said that really he said i want to become mm -hmm. i want to become and that's an that that is a mindset isn't it I yep. want to become. But go ahead, keep going. Um, that, that, that's all I got for now. I, I'm, that's all right. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so uh, what else do we have there, Jeff, uh, as it relates? Uh, let's see. Change is growth. Change is good. Adapt with it. When you change, it can impact the group. Uh, and I agree very much with this. And one of the greatest rock drummers still seeking continual improvement. I like that because he could have easily stayed where he was and still be considered in the minimum top 10, if not the top two or three drummers of all time. Um, yeah. Change That's is good. Great. Never rest on your laurels. Change is striving towards a greater future. Yeah. And, and if you'll notice, guys, and I notice this even with your, your comments here, this is about being proactive with change, right? And, and obviously there's changes that come our way that are disappointing and are, are maybe heartbreaking or fill in the blank that don't go our way. But I think there's one thing, if, if we keep a mindset of being proactive, even when the bad stuff hits, we're, we're well positioned to handle it and to, to manage our way through it. And I think um, if you know some of Neil Peart's uh, story, won't go into it tonight, but you'll find some areas of his life back in the 90s where, you know, I'm sure this had to help him a lot, a whole mm -hmm. lot. Yes. So um, where we're going to move to next is we're going to get into some definitions around emotional intelligence. And, and if I can, um, think a little bit about this video again and think about some of the things we talked about. What are some of the emotions that typically come into play when we're thinking about change? And some can be good, some can be bad, right? Uh, but ultimately, we, we really truly know at our core that it's not that emotions are bad or good, it's really kind of what we do with them, right? How we apply what emotions are telling us because emotions are communicators. So the next phase here, we're going to take a look at some things around definitions. Jeff is going to kind of take the wheel and talk to you a bit about that and about the model that we use inside of Spirit of EQ and our uh, partner, uh, Six Seconds. Uh, Eric, uh, why don't I go over people typed in a bunch of stuff about uh, how they feel about change or cool. what? Yes. So fear, fear and anxiety, fear, dread, somebody in all caps put terror, stress, doubt, anxiety, excitement, uneasy, fear, uh, excitement, fear of failure, 
it's natural human instinct to fear the unknown, fear of exposing my failure to other people, adjustments to your comfort zone. So it's more really good things. So yeah. yeah. Hey, and Jeff, um, yeah. and, and I was going to say this, I think I did at the beginning. And those of you who are joining us, when Jeff and I do our podcast, when the ideas come, we just give each other room. So here's an idea, <laughs> Jeff, I'm, I'm, uh, it just leaves out for me, right? Yeah. So that part, all these different emotions, and I did mention there that emotions are communications, right? Mm -hmm. Communicator tools. So when we think about fear, right, what is fear trying to tell us? Now, certainly, if we run across a grizzly bear on a nature path, fear is probably telling us, you got to do something, you got to get out of here, or what have you. Um, or it could be that fear is telling you something that's kind of irrational, right? Like, I've heard this in my own head at times. Oh, no one's going to buy that book. It's, it's going to be a complete failure. Now, I don't know that. I don't have evidence of that. I don't have any data for that. But that emotion is communicating something. This definition, and as Jeff is going to start here in a minute, I think really kind of encapsulates how powerful emotional intelligence can be for us all. It's just managing that thought and that emotion and then make a decision. That's at its core, its simplest. So Jeff, I'll kind of hand it over to you to take okay. the next session here. Well, you'll see the term six seconds. Uh, Spirit of EQ, which is our local company, is a preferred partner of a global company called Six Seconds. Uh, they're actually a nonprofit. Uh, they're very involved in things like uh, the Children's Day Initiative from uh, United Nations, things like that. They provide all the assessment tools we use. And also, we, because we use the assessment tools, we use and agree with their definitions of a lot of things. So uh, emotional intelligence is effectively blending thinking and feeling to make optimal decisions. So it, it, it's taking that that rational part of your mind, the thinking part of your mind, and combining it with the information that your emotions, what you're feeling is giving you. Like Eric said, emotions are no more than data. Um, what turns an emotion into a positive or negative is what you do with it. So it's basically using your emotions to make better decisions. We sometimes have a tendency to think that emotions are not involved in our decisions. They're involved in, in almost all of them, one way or the other. Uh, if you're driving and, you know, the traffic light turns red right in front of you, there's actually a little bit of fear driving that, whether you're going to stop or not. You might worry about if I go through the red light, just as it changes, I might get an accident. There might be a policeman following me, so I'm afraid I might get a ticket. So even in these split-second decisions, there is some emotion involved in it. So uh, what we're trying to do when we work with anybody uh, is, is to use the emotions for what they're there for, which is to give you data to help make uh, a, an informed response instead of react. And also the, the name six seconds from the company that we're preferred partner of comes from how long it takes your body to recover from all that, like Eric mentioned, fear. When, when you feel the emotion of fear, the amygdala and some other parts of your brain that aren't really very thinking parts of your brain, dump a lot of chemicals into your system to get you ready to fight, you know, uh, obviously flight, run away, uh, freeze, you know, play dead, don't, don't respond, or to flop to find somebody else. But if you can wait six seconds to before you respond to whatever that thing is that's causing you emotion, your thinking brain can take back over. And if you've heard the old thing about counting to 10, uh, that takes about six seconds. Uh, one of the women we work with, she names the dwarfs from Snow White, right? Yeah, uh, in alphabetical order because that gets her brain back into the thinking part and it makes her laugh when she does it. So if you can take that six seconds, then you're going to be able to start making a rational decision. And, and that's what that is. Um, a lot of times we don't do that. Uh, somebody put in there that, I think, what, what did they say? Road rage, 
you know, will influence your driving behavior and ability? Yes, it does. Uh, conquering your road rage, which is difficult to do, influence your decisions a little bit better when you're driving. Uh, so Eric, you want to go ahead to the next one? Yeah. And uh, guys, I also want to mention to you, um, there is a, a rule that um, I learned a long time ago, and I try to remind myself of it every day. And it's the 90-10 rule. And it's that 90% of our life will be made up of the decisions we made. The other 10% will be the stuff that you never could see coming, the surprises, good or bad. And that's one of the things why I'm so passionate about our work is that we want to help as many people as we can be better decision makers. Because the better that you are at making decisions, and, and the key is, again, managing that thought and that emotion, the better you're at it making decisions, the better your life's going to be, the better your family's going to be, the better your work situation is going to be, your college experience, studying, all that stuff gets better. It's not perfection. It's not a silver bullet, but typically think about in your own life, the people you know who are good at making decisions, they typically have a pretty fantastic life. All right, so get you to the next one there. Yes, so these are some things that EQ is not. Um, it's not just being nice. It's just not liking everybody and just going along with everybody and and not causing a problem or not speaking your mind, not saying the good ideas you might have, not, you know, cautioning people that if there's something that you really know that might be a bad path to go down, whether personally or at work. So it's not just being nice. EQ is not being emotional. Uh, it does not mean that uh, you have to have a huge visible reaction with your emotions. And sometimes you will, if, if you're very angry, sometimes it's going to come out as, as being on the surface. Back to that iceberg that, that we started with, you're going to see that. But a lot of times that emotional is below the waterline in that iceberg. So it's not just having your emotions out there all the time. Would you say that EQ is a form of dis discipline? Actually it is, and we'll probably get into that in a few minutes, I see the question. Uh, it's not about your personality. It's not really uh, things like that. It's a little bit different. Uh, it's more at the core. It's not what people see again. And it's the opposite of I2. You know, your intelligence is very rational thinking, very uh, set. You know, you can do a few things maybe to get a few more IQ points, but you're pretty much born with what IQ you have. You're not gonna really be able to increase it that much. You might learn new techniques, new facts, new uh, skills that you might learn, but your IQ is going to stay the same. The really cool thing that we found with emotional intelligence or EQ is it is a learnable skill. If you wanna put the practice in or the discipline, I like that word too, uh, you're going to be able to change your IQ. If there's an area, and you'll, you'll see that in, a, in the next couple of slides, we have things we call competencies. If there's one of those competencies that you would like to improve, you can work on that competency to change your emotional intelligence. And the other thing about it is, if you take one of our assessments, especially the full one, which is called a say, if you take that and you're in a really good place and everything is going great and there's no problems, you take it today. Now, in a month, if you've had some major setbacks, maybe a, a death in the family or a job loss or some other very serious things happen that are not really good, your EQ is going to be different. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is not a static thing. You you can it, it's just supposed to be like that is the best way to say it. Your EQ is going to be changing either by what you do to improve it or by setbacks that might you know, cause it to go down. Any, any questions? If you do, just be sure to type them in. I was gonna say too, Jeff, uh, kind of heading a little bit back to the personality thing um, because we do get this from time to time. People will say, well, yeah, I, I, I took a disc profile or a Myers-Briggs or an Enneagram like mm. a month ago or whatever. And what we tell them is those are great tools. However, 
to Jeff's point earlier, right? Uh, EQ is dynamic and it's, it's a changing thing. Um, personality is kind of like IQ. I'm an introvert. Um, the reason why I can be more animated and more outgoing is because I'm leveraging my emotional intelligence to do that. But my preference is, is to go inward. You know, give me Miles Davis and a glass of wine and I'm all good, right? <laughs> However, in the case of with emotional intelligence, again, I'm leveraging and you'll see some of these competencies to move me to being able to perform, being able to interact in a way that is not inwardly driven. Um, and then also I'll, I'll throw this out and Jeff and I, we haven't talked about this a lot, but I've noticed that in the multiple times that I've taken my, uh, the say that Jeff mentioned, we, it's our full fledged report about emotional intelligence is that I noticed that when these different storms of life are happening is that some of my competencies have gotten stronger. And I'm, yes. I don't have science behind this to say, hey, it's a trend, but it has encouraged me that the more that I work on this learnable skill called EQ, the better I am able to handle, again, that stuff that hits me out of nowhere or the, the difficulties of life that are just general for everybody. So I just wanted to kind of point that out to you too. Jeff, was there any comments? Yeah, to, to, to just to build on what Eric said, uh, yeah, I have noticed that too. Everybody that I know in our preferred partner network say the same thing. As an example, if you have a lot of decisions that you have to make, uh, one of the competencies is consequential thinking. If that, that's where you are in your life right now, your consequential thinking will be higher than it normally is. If, uh, if you're going through a really, really, really good time, your optimism may rate, go higher. Uh, which we'll get into a little bit more definitions of that. But yes, it, and, and what we teach people when we're coaching someone is if you are, let's say you have very good consequential thinking, well, let's use that strength to maybe help one of the other competencies. We, we want to work with the person's strength and concentrate on that, not on something that might be a little bit lower at that time. Yeah. You know? Okay, so this is the basic model of EQ that you use. It's circular, so we'll start with the blue, know yourself. That's, that's being aware of your own feelings, recognizing patterns. We'll get into that a little bit more, but it's being aware. Choosing yourself is kind of where you're starting to make the decisions about what you want to do. And then the giving yourself is the why that you're doing it the reason that you're doing what you're doing. And that'll be a little bit clearer on the next slide. So if you look in the note, well, one more thing about the, the circular pattern, the reason we do that is you can start that cycle anywhere in it. Normally you would start in the know yourself and go around to choose and give, uh, but you can jump into that circle any, any place you are. So in the know yourself, enhance emotional literacy. That's basically understanding what emotion you're feeling and understand what that emotion is telling you. Um, you may feel uneasy, which uneasy is kind of on the spectrum of uh, fear. So that means there's something there that you need to pay attention to. Um, it's giving you information again. And also emotional literacy is the ability to see as best we can, what the person you're interacting with is feeling, to understand that maybe they are feeling fear, and then you will interact with them differently than if they're feeling, you know, optimism and excitement. So it's it's important, you know, it's the starting point, and then recognize patterns. Um, recognizing a pattern is knowing how you're normally going to react when something happens and to work on those patterns so that instead of reacting to something, you learn to respond. If my, you know, my boss tells me on Friday, I have a big project that is, has, is due on Monday, how am I gonna to respond to that? Am I gonna get upset? Am I gonna get angry? Or am I going to, you know, which would be a reaction, tell the boss to go someplace that he probably doesn't wanna to go to and or are you just going to do the pattern of accepting it? 
And once again, recognizing patterns is something that you want to recognize in other people. Uh, it's great if you can recognize patterns and respond back to the person because you see how they're acting or you know that if I do this, they're going to react badly. So maybe I need to reframe what I'm going to ask them to do or what I, information I need to tell them. This one can actually be used for evil. It's called pushing buttons, where <laughs> if anybody's been married for a long time, spouses probably have a whole keyboard of buttons to push to, uh, to get somebody upset. But you can do that with people other than your spouse. So it's important to remember <laughs> somebody put on a rock star at that. Thank you. Uh, I can be too. Uh, so that's the knowing yourself. It's being aware. And then the choose yourself is when you, you start thinking through what you're going to do. So the first one is consequential thinking. If I do this, the chances are this is going to happen. You know, so that I am understanding that there is a consequence to what I'm doing and to actually take the time to think it through. You know, what, what result am I looking for? What am I trying to get to? So consequential thinking. Now, navigate emotions is just what it sounds like. It's when I am feeling emotions, how am I going to work through them? What am I going to do to take what that emotion is telling me and then turn it into a good response? And that's also navigating other people's emotions. Like I said, the, the emotional literacy in someone else, if someone is, is going through a rough time, how am I going to navigate their emotions? Am I going to just accept it and, and let them work through it? You know, depending on the, the, uh, the relationship that you might have, am I going to, you know, get a little bit deeper with that person? It totally depends on, where I'm at in that relationship, but be able to navigate that. And once again, the one thing I always like to think about is before you can navigate, you need to know where you started. If you are using a GPS, whether it's a Garmin or, you know, on your phone, that GPS can't tell you how to get someplace unless it knows where it is. Uh, so there's that. Now, intrinsic motivation there, there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is when you are motivated to do something by things outside of yourself. It could be you, you, you just, you know, your fear of interacting with this person, so you don't want to. Uh, we get a lot of in, or extrinsic motivation from media and some of those things that we mentioned when Eric had that, uh, that first slide up with all the lines going over the world. Those are the kind of things that motivate us. Uh, advertising is extrinsic motivation. They're you know trying to get you to buy the their pickup truck or drink their beer. So what is important is intrinsic motivation. Are you motivated by your inner guide, by what is important to you, by your set of morals and standards? So if you're intrinsically motivated, that'll keep you on on the path. It'll allow you to do the things that you really want to do and not let someone else or something else guide that. Uh, optimism is just what it is. It's not, it's not cheerleading. But optimism is, uh, somebody asks, is that for six seconds coming to the play? Yes, when you're looking at those things. But optimism is, how do you approach a problem? Do you approach it with doom and despair or do you do approach it with, yeah, we can get through that. Now, one of the things that I caution people if I'm doing coaching and they may rank really high in optimism is that's another of the, uh, these competencies that can actually get you in trouble if you overuse it. If you're, you're a team leader or manager, supervisor, whatever, and you've got to talk to your team about a very, very difficult project that you're going to do. And everybody knows that it is going to be tough. There's going to be overtime or weekends or you're, you're just dealing with a rough thing. If you come in as the cheerleader, they're not going, yeah, cautious optimism, I like that. They're not going to really take you very seriously if you're posing this thing of everything is going to be, you know, just fantastic. Um, you know, it's like if you're watching a football game and, and the team is behind uh, 
56 to nothing and you know five minutes to go in the fourth quarter and the cheerleaders are still going it's not going to make any difference okay <laughs> it's just not so you, you you want to have optimism but you want to use it to help motivate so these are the things so you look at these four competencies the choose yourself and they're going to help you decide what you're going to do and the last one is to give yourself and to me they're the most important competencies the ones there in green. So develop empathy. And I just want to make sure that we understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. Uh, sympathy is feeling sorry for someone else, just not really understanding what they're going through. And to me, it's almost like you have a feeling of superiority because yeah, you feel sorry for them, but you're glad that you're not in that situation. And it comes across uh, that way. And then somebody just put empathy is putting yourself in their shoes. So empathy is actually trying to connect with that person where they are. If you want to see a very, very good short YouTube video, uh, search for Brene Brown and her um, short video about empathy. It's a little cartoon but it's to me, and I think Eric will agree, it's probably the best demonstration of the difference between sympathy and empathy there is. So it's just type up, look up Benet Brown and empathy, and that'll give you a very good idea of empathy. And the last one, which is to me the most important, is called Pursue Noble Goals. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, I would like everybody to think about with the developed empathy um, and Jeff and I have talked about this numerous times, is that it's also self-empathy. Mm. Um, yes. A lot of times we've encountered folks that they care about every single individual in their universe. But when you ask them, well, what about you? There's usually that awkward silence. Because we're so quick to be the friend and the person that will stand in the gap for all kinds of people. The, the no, superhero. We, superhero, yeah. But we need to do that for ourselves. We need to be able to, and I'm speaking of somebody who is going through, has for years, learning how to be self-empathetic. We need to be able to give ourselves a break. When, when the mistake happens, we need to be that person inside of ourselves that says, hey, look, stuff happens. Hey, look, it was a mistake. You got to move on. Because if we're not careful, we'll hold the world on our shoulders and let ourselves just kind of waste away. So just wanted to throw that out. But oh, go ahead. Yes. I'm glad you prompt me, Eric. The other thing to think about with the self-empathy is what kind of self-talk do you have when you don't come meet your expectations if you make a mistake if uh you happen to uh whatever what is your self-talk what what, you, what is going through your head instead of going yeah okay i know i made a mistake i know i need to, to to work on this so maybe it doesn't happen or i need to improve it but i'm human and it's okay to make a mistake or are you just beating yourself up um, that's what a lot of people do. And I've seen people do it that are off the scale with empathy, but they've never considered the self-empathy. So thank you, Eric. I'm, yeah. I'm, I had that written down even, and I went right by it. So that's why Eric and I work well together. We backstop each other. So then the last one I consider is the best. It's called Pursue Noble Goals. Um, a noble goal is kind of interesting. Um, one, it's not something that you're ever going to uh, complete in your lifetime because it's a very basic part of who you are. It's not a goal like I want to be the president of the company or make a million dollars or have a 10,000 square foot house. Nothing wrong with those goals, but it's a goal that lives at the core of who you are. It's what makes you do the things you do. And it's so important, like I said, you are not going to be able to complete it in your lifetime because even if you retire, that noble goal is still driving you in your day-to-day -day life. It's not about the world's version of success. Uh, a noble goal can't harm anyone. It, it has to put other people first, and it's difficult to develop. Uh, 
but I think it's what drives everything else. If you if you have a strong noble goal and it needs to be no more than two sentences, best is one sentence. Uh, my noble goal is to help people find the art in themselves because I think everybody has something at their core that is beautiful and they most people don't know it. So that's just a very simple one one sentence definition and it didn't come overnight, it takes time. Uh, Eric, do you have anything else about Noble Goal? Yeah, I think uh, you've hit it really well there, Jeff. Okay. I do want to say one more thing about the competencies. Uh, if you would like to dig deeper, and um, I'm going to plug our podcast again, like Eric did. Eric did. Uh, I believe we have a podcast devoted to every one of those competencies. I'm pretty sure we do. Yeah, and you're right about that, Jeff. Um, and it's really, it's really easy if you – grab your podcast through Apple or any of the other uh, outlets, just type in spirit of EQ and you can subscribe and download uh, multiple episodes. And we, we have gone through a series of covering each of the competencies. Plus a lot of other things, including, see, did we talk about Neil Pearl on the podcast or that was a webcast? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> that was, that was, uh, that was a uh, video cast. So, okay. Are uh, you webinar. Sorry. It was a webinar. Boy, I'm yes. losing my mind. We'll talk okay. about that too later. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we also, anyway, so EQ in action. So know yourself. What am I feeling? Are you able to, if somebody asks you, what are you feeling right now? What is the emotion that you're feeling? Uh, are you feeling sad? Are you feeling excited? Uh, what options do I have and what do I really want? So you look at those things. Another way to do it is you think. You think about what it is you want. You choose, you know, uh, what am I feeling? What am I going to do? And then act. What do I really want? So think, feel, and act. You, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff. I, I cut you off there. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, another key thing about this particular um, area of the choose yourself, when it talks about what options do I have, and in working with a number of people from a lot of different areas uh, of, of life, uh, socioeconomic, fill in the blank. One of the dangers in the lives that we live here, uh, at least in the United States, is that people think they have a lot less options than they really do. Um, I would challenge you, encourage you uh, to, to, to be thinking about that you have more options than than maybe the two that are going through your mind. Maybe the two negative ones that you, that are resounding. Just take some time to go, well, wait a minute. Is it just these two options or do I have more? And typically you have a lot more options than you think you have. So just wanted to throw that out there too. Okay. Can we, I want to go over some of the stuff that people have been putting in the, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Pause for a bit. Yeah. Uh, some of the ones are all great. Uh, I guess they were talking about empathy. This hits on a lot of levels. How can you truly care, help others if you cannot do the same for yourself? Uh, a lot of somebody said they feel hypercritical. Uh, our own worst critic. I like this one. Be your own best friend. Would you say it to a friend? If not, don't say it to yourself. Be your oh, own best friend. That's good. Yes. <laughs> that's really I, good. Yes. <laughs> If you don't say it, to, instead replace it what you would tell a friend who is down on themselves. You guys are really doing great with these things. So, uh, and somebody did put, I, I don't know how to be that person. When we're working on it, on one of these competencies, that's how you become that kind of a person. It's, it's the practice. Uh, you know, if we would have went, you know, like we had Neil Peart on before as a drummer, a lot of people think that when a musician gets to that level that they just show up and perform. They practice more than a beginner to do it because they know they have to practice this to be able to do what they want. And it's the same with emotional intelligence. If you don't practice it and keep it in front of you, it won't improve. But the, the easiest thing or the easiest way to increase your emotional intelligence, maybe if you do want to show empathy, is to practice it. I think that that is the most important thing. So, yeah. So what we do, if you look at the diagram here, you know, action, it's what we do. How do we do it? It's our choice. And then why we do it is our purpose. So we'll 
when we give, somebody just can't work on an area unless you, anyway, when you give, when you do the why, it's to better someone else. It's to make someone good. And that does not have to be some huge, big mission project or um, something like that. It can be, that would be great, but it could be when you were buying your groceries at the grocery store, did you make it better for the person that was checking you out or bagging your groceries? Did you make their day a little bit better because of how you treated them? <clears throat> you know, maybe you saw them and you actually asked the question, how are you doing? And you really meant it, not just as a, a space filler, like a lot of us do. Uh, same thing, at, you know, when you're working, if you ask somebody how they're doing, do you ever actually stop and listen to what they're saying <clears throat> and connect? So it takes practice and it just okay. makes everything better for everyone. And uh, Jeff, I, I will throw out as well, guys, you know, this idea of practice um, is uh, on the face of it. If, if, if you haven't been familiar, haven't been exposed to emotional intelligence, um, it can seem like, okay, well, when is this and why is this all of that thing? I can tell you from experience and um, Jeff would be in the same tribe through consistent practice, you will get results. Um, I can't guarantee it because I don't have that ability to, but I can tell you from my experience in my own life and my experience in helping our clients is that those that are willing to practice put in the work, we'll get the results. And this alignment idea is really kind of rooted around kind of putting yourself in position. You don't have to be super smart. You don't have to be uh, from a certain type of family and have a certain amount of money. It's a matter of you just capitalizing on what's happening inside of you like every other human being on the planet. It's just when you encounter people who have really high emotional intelligence, it says they've been practicing and they've been putting in the work typically. So as we move on, I wanted to show you this um, little uh, map. It's kind of visually um, <laughs> blinding for me, but it is uh, a Plutchnik's emotional map. And you can Google this if you want to see the diagram in a, in a different way. But basically it's a, it's a tool to help you understand the intensity of emotion um, we're not going through all of these, but I like it because it kind of gives you a sense about naming some of those things, right? So when we look uh, at, the, at the one at the very top there in the center where we're on the outer edge and think of it in terms of the more that you get to the center, the more the intensity of the emotion, serenity, joy, and ecstasy. And then on the opposite end at the bottom, pensiveness sadness, and then grief. We show you this because we want you to have a, a bit of understanding about what these, what these emotions are. Um, you can look up definitions of them, and maybe you can start this process of kind of being able to identify them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't, don't, um, don't be quick to dismiss them. If you're in, a, if you're in a, an area where you have joy, explore that a bit. Where is that coming from? What's being communicated to me? What's happening in my life? Grief, same deal, amazement, terror, apprehension, whatever it may be. Because the more you are familiar, the better you're going to be at managing them and, and, and using them as tools for your strength. So, Eric, can I, I want to say yeah, something. Absolutely. I'm going to go back to something I just thought about with empathy. A lot of times we think empathy is only when we want to be with somebody that's going through a bad thing. You know, they're going through a, a, a situation that's not good and they feel sad or they feel some of these. You can also be empathetic to somebody that's just, just everything is going great and share with them. Like he said, the serenity, joy, and ecstasy, maybe share their joy. You know, I'm happy for you. I'm really great that this has happened. That reinforces there, this good emotion, this feeling of joy, uh, 
that kind of thing. So don't forget it's just about uh, using that as just when somebody's sad. It's just as important, I think, to help reinforce somebody that's having a good time because in today's world, those are fewer and fewer and farther apart. Yeah. Okay. So we'll take some basic messages that come out from some of those emotions that you would have saw on that map. For example, <clears throat> anger. A typical question around anger is what is in the way? What's blocking? Anticipation. What important thing is coming? Joy. What do you want to man maintain? Trust. What do you want to embrace? And keep in mind that these questions are not necessarily always the questions that relate to that particular emotion. It could be different, but these are some of the typical basic messages. Fear. What is at risk? Surprise. What is unexpected? Sadness. What are you losing that you love? Disgust. Maybe what rules are broken? So let's stop for a minute um, and maybe in the chat, uh, what do you think, again, and we, we, uh, we throw this out to you, realizing that, you know, we're kind of on this journey just starting and all. You may be real, real familiar, may not be very familiar at all. But what are some of the messages you think the emotions that you've had in this last week have been telling you? What have they been communicating to you? Think of the last week and then type in the chat if you feel comfortable. And then, Jeff, I'll let you kind of monitor that as well. Okay. Somebody's feeling anticipation for sure. Stressed out. So, and as you're typing and Jeff's observing there, when you think about that, um, what that communication is, we, we looked at a little bit earlier. And I'm going to go back to that here in a second as, as we're kind of, getting close to the end, but um, what is it you think, what kind of decision making can happen with some of these messages that are coming to you? And I, and I get it, we're in a safe place. We're not encountering all the different stuff that comes at us on a daily basis, the stressors, the, the anxieties, the, all this, the messaging and whatnot. But if we have that window of time, I really believe that even when stuff's coming at you really fast, you can slow it down a little bit, maybe for that six seconds, and kind of go, okay, I'm feeling anger. Why am I feeling angry about this? What's, what's blocking me? What's in the way? Well, it's this person's this, or this course, or this job. Well, what are my options? We go back to that. So Jeff, go ahead and read some more of those and I'm gonna take us back a little bit uh, to okay. look at the, uh, the competencies. I got a cruise coming for the holiday, yay. Overwhelmed and happy, sadness. Stressed out and excited for two different reasons. Not being able to manage stress. Trust in my decisions toward my goals and past. I know that I've been more so angry. I am quick to anger so it doesn't help when things don't go the right way. Anticipation and anger at finals, fear again, anticipation and some fear worry, relief that finals will be over soon, anticipation and joy, expectations. I think it's really great that you guys are being able to identify these emotions. That's the first step in the, in the practicing. Yes. Yeah. Put a yeah. name on it. That's really good. Yeah, so I want to kind of take us here, and I know we've got uh, we got a, probably about five minutes, uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna come to a close. But 
when you look at this, these competencies again, think about what those emotions that you named and what you felt like they were telling you. Which of these competencies do you think you could maybe target that might help you toward a breakthrough or toward a really good decision? So think about that for a minute and then uh, type in the chat. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, something from my own personal. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm, tend to be really, really good at recognizing patterns. And I always have been. And, and as I began to, this emotional intelligence journey, I, I got really good at it and kept practicing at it. So much so that um, when I'm in a situation where I start to feel insecure, like when I start to feel like, well, maybe the work I'm doing isn't as good as the 50,000 people on LinkedIn, right? Um, mm -hmm. Recognizing patterns helps me go, wait a minute, Eric. This is typically what can happen in social media. You'll, you, you've got this temptation to compare yourself. Watch out. That helps me immensely because I can quickly go, hold on, I got to stop here. And I might even venture over into consequential thinking, which might tell me, you know what, Eric, there's no data that says that 50,000 people are better at their work than you. You got to let go of that. That's part of the practice part. But go ahead, Jeff, what do we have there for the for uh, some of the competencies that might be able to be used? Emotional literacy with their fiance, help her manage her stress with other drivers on the road, then you can help me. Uh, I think it is telling me I need to be more open to stressors and let go of the little things that are making me angry. When somebody is talking about Stephen's cruise, thanks, Jim, when, or Stephen is, when I'm sticking on my Mai Tai, I will raise my glass in your name. So that's not really a stressor. I don't think that's really not what we're asking for. But way to go, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Recognize patterns and understand them. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all, all these things are the first step. So um, here's what we'll do. Um, we, uh, we have recorded this session um, and I will get this to you, Mahmoud. Um, so you'll have that for anyone who didn't attend. And obviously you can do that, uh, potentially with those that are on tonight, if you want to kind of review back, you know, what we've talked about. Um, I will go ahead and tell you uh, if you are interested and want to listen to the podcast, we've, kind of mentioned that you can go to any of those outlets type in the search for spirit of eq you'll find us with apple and with google um, and all of those uh, as well as we have a youtube channel which is a place where you can get some video content we we do something called a video cast that's kind of an accompaniment to the podcast which is kind of designed to give you a video experience we typically interview great guests and sometimes jeff and i will do those together uh, we do record our webinars that we do for the general public, so you can find some content there. And then there's some one-offs that uh, we've done as well that are just quick two-minute tips and tricks, if you will. Uh, so with that, uh, Jeff, do you also, have Also, that? Eric, our, our website. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's just simply spiritofeq.com. Um, wonderful spot, too, uh, where you can get some materials, or I should say you can get some resources from that regard. Uh, and Mahmoud, I, I have no problem. Jeff wouldn't either. If anybody wants to get a hold of us because maybe they want to unlock a little bit more of something they heard tonight, they can email us. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, it's just Eric at Spirit of EQ and Jeff at Spirit of EQ, uh, dot com. And Jeff, unless there's anything else, uh, we'll go ahead and close out tonight. Um, any questions from anyone out there as well that we might want to touch on before we say good night? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. A lot of the comments or all of the comments that you guys shared were really good. Um, I'm going to go back and look at them because we can. There was a, I like, I love the one about if you wouldn't say it to a friend, don't say it to someone else. So I'm going to have to type that up and hang it on my wall. <laughs> so. 
Me too. Me too. So with that, we'll go ahead and close out and say good night to everyone. Thank you for uh, being with us, and we look forward Thank to seeing you, you next week. Thank you, Eric and Jeff, for, uh, for the lovely night. We enjoyed it. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. I'll end the meeting. Talk to you later. See ya.